we take gold to. You know. I want to talk this morning about, uh, for a few minutes, about faithfulness um, and, uh, and the call in the scriptures to faithfulness and to holiness, to righteous living, to faithfulness in our, in our heart's attitude. And uh, so just let's bow our hearts just for a minute. Ask me, uh, let, me, let me ask for the help from the Holy Spirit. And you just agree with me, please. Lord, help me to bring this word, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Be glorified, um, edify, equip, encourage, challenge if need be the hearers of this word, I pray this morning. And I'll thank you for it. Amen. You know, it's a crazy time of year and a crazy time of life, this pandemic and, you know, the economic questions and um, there's just so much going on, isn't there? Um, but I don't think God's sitting in the heavens wringing his hands, you know? <laughs> and uh, I don't think he's wondering when the right time is to come and to return and rapture the church. Um, I, he set a day for that, hasn't he? Um, like he always has a day set. You know, I mean, he's coming back, man, and it's inevitable. There's nothing that you and I can do to stop that. It's just like his first coming in Bethlehem. I mean, it was prophesied many times in scriptures, and there was really nothing that anyone could do to uh, prevent that from happening. But he came at a time, and he came in a place. And it was the right time in the right place. Who can argue with God about that? He created the heavens and the earth. He created days himself. Though we read in the scriptures that Abraham had to wait long for his promised son to be born. God had a certain day planned for that Isaac to come. Amen. It was the right time when Sarah gave birth. God had a day planned for King David to become the king, to be ordained the king, even though he had to endure some 30 years of persecution, running around some odd many number of years, um, under the oppressive hand of Saul, who was jealous of him. And God's own son, who came in Bethlehem, was born of a virgin, he came at a certain day and time, and even though Israel had to wait for how long for that promised son? Literally thousands of years. And we get tired of a seven-month pandemic. And I don't blame you. I am tired of it too. But... A waiting game is a part of life, isn't it? It really is. Here's a story that tells a lot about the Christian life and about the waiting game, about patience, and about faithfulness. And it's from Luke 18. And it's 1 through 8. And I'll read it. He was telling them a parable, Jesus was, of course, to show that at all times they ought to pray and not become discouraged. Boy, we could camp right there, couldn't we? We could camp right there. Pray at all times and don't be discouraged. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect any man. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my opponent. The pandemic's driving me crazy. For a while he was unwilling. But later he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect any man, yet because this widow is bothering me, I will give her justice. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she's going to wear me right out. And the Lord said, Jesus said to them, listen to what the unrighteous judge said. 
Now will God not bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? And will he delay long for them? I tell you, he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? A sobering question. Jesus himself asked that question. When I come back, will I find faith on the earth? You know, I want to be a part of those who have faith. I want to be a part of the faithful. I want to be faithful to him. I want to be faithful to him in spite of the delay in my prayer requests. I want to be faithful to him, be found faithful in spite of being tired. I want to be faithful in spite of my flesh which screams against waiting and delay. I want to be faithful to him in spite of all the negative circumstances that seem to be surrounding my life and nagging at my conscience. How can I say I have faith if I'm not first faithful to him and then to the people around me that are most important to my wife and my family and the church? You people. I don't want Jesus coming back again and, uh, and, and find me born again, but still thinking and talking and acting like the world. I don't want to be struggling with the sins that he has declared me to be free from. I want him to find me truly faithful, separated, from the world. You know, it's interesting. Mary and I were listening to some, uh, well, we were not listening. We were singing some old kind of hymns and praise and worship songs from the 70s and 80s. And uh, we were, I was saved in 87, 88. So they were beautiful. They were really wonderful. And we kind of said, you know, why do these songs kind of sound a little different from Caleb today, you know, and what's going on? Because, you know, they didn't, they, they weren't as much maybe rock and roll -y, you know. No, I love rock and roll. I do. Um, and the church has taken back that rock and roll sound, you know, through worship and praise, haven't they, right? Praise God for that. But it was, it almost sounded to our ears, didn't it, and our heart, otherworldly. It was interesting. It was really separated. It sounded separated. You know, Heidi. He is the living God, enduring forever, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you. I think I even actually carried a tune there for a second. Wow. Gosh. Who remembered that one? Yeah. Yeah, you do, of course, being an old CCR girl yourself, just like we are. So you'd love that. I kind of think it was maybe Assembly of God. Maybe it was an Assembly of God. I don't know if, but, but you know, there was, we almost, we almost noted there was kind of a little of a Jewish uh, flavor, Old Testament Hebraic flavor to some of the, the songs and some of the wording. It was just different. But I think that, you know, we as a church, you know, we want to look differently. We do. We want to sing differently. We want to pray differently. We want to talk differently from the surrounding culture. In, I, you know, I want my spirit man to be different. I want my soul, even my body, to be different. Here is a description of the church that Jesus believes in. This is who he's coming back for. And it's from Ephesians 5, 27. It says, Paul's writing to the Ephesian church, 
And he says that he, Jesus, might present to himself the church in all her glory, a glory body, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. You know, I know that some might think it's unrealistic. Taking into consideration the state of our world, how fallen it is. I'm telling you, I I turned on the television last night. I just, you you know, click, 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 click. I mean, I cannot believe what's on just standard television. Standard. Horrible. Of course, to unbelievers, talking about being holy and blameless is crazy. I mean, they haven't even got an idea. It's offensive. It's offensive to unbelievers. How can we really be holy and blameless? Some might say, well, doesn't his grace cover my failure to walk in a holy and blameless way? Right? Well, yes, of course it does. But though this is true, it does not cancel out my responsibility to walk holy before him. That does not cancel out my responsibility. So just consider for a moment, church, where where in your own life does holy and blameless really not fit in your, in your life today, in your behavior, in your thoughts, in your wording? in the events of your life. You know, sometimes I feel like we just need to allow what's on the inside from the new birth to show on the outside. Sometimes we just need to decide to stop sinning. True. We just need to say, man, I'm going to stop there right now. To declare an end to old habits that die hard. Amen? Amen? We are, after all, called saints in the Bible by the Holy Spirit. Um, Saints means separated ones, holy ones. From the Greek word hagios, H-A-G-I-O-S. I am told there are roughly 63 times we're called saints in the New Testament letters. 63 times. I can't think of one place we're called sinners in the New Testament. Anybody? I I, I can't think anybody. Many, many places we're called saints. You know, Romans 1, 7. To all the beloved of God in Canastota called as saints. Oh, I meant Rome. (laughs) Romans 1, 7. To all the beloved of God in Rome called as saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we're made saints by believing on the Lord. We have been set apart from the world when we come to believe right away, immediately. The Bible says we become a new creation. And, and think of that. We, we do not even have to teach Sunday school. Amen. Thank you for that. I think, I think the Lord's saying it's time to take the wood, the wood seriously. <laughs> I, I silence my phone. <laughs> That's what I do, brother. <laughs> yeah. Nice nice ring, though. I really like it, you know? Nice ring. Sounds like dinner hour, you know? <laughs> so we don't have to teach Sunday school. We don't have to bring one tithe. We don't have to raise the dead. We don't have to go to one prayer meeting or lead worship for a church, or manage the church technology. All we have to do is believe rightly and receive. And we are made saints. It's a beautiful thing. God is so gracious. We don't have to earn a thing, obtain a thing. Isn't God gracious and good? To change our identity through Christ, through faith by grace. It's amazing. I will be studying that and trying to get my arms around that till the day I go to be with him. Amen? I will. I want to read uh, 
1 Corinthians 1.30, but I want to read it from the New Living. You can put up the New American, uh, Brian, that's okay, translation. But I want to read this, this, this particular verse from the New Living. It just says it so well. It says, God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ. Our, uh, for our benefit, God made Christ to be wisdom itself. He is the one who made us acceptable to God. He made us pure and holy, and he gave himself to purchase our freedom. I just love that translation. Truth is, the New Testament is full of rich references for us to indeed, indeed live like we are set apart, like we are holy. A people intentionally set apart from the world around us because God lives in us. You know, 1 Corinthians 3.16, I remind you of that verse. It says, do you not know, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? You know, Paul's reminder here is a calling up to the church, the people in Corinth, because they were sinning. They were, they were mixing in. And, and it was, he was calling them up to remind them, hey, God is in you. What are you thinking about? Why are you acting like you're acting? He was trying to motivate the church to change their way of thinking and of their worldly behavior. The call to holy living is woven throughout the New Testament. In other places, the New Testament indicates that anticipation of the Lord's soon return is an excellent motive for holy living. You know, we don't talk about his second coming too much. But oftentimes where you see uh, his second coming predicted or talked about, holiness is linked to it. It's therefore good to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Indeed, God so loves his church, he wants us to be looking for his appearing. And he certainly wants us to be holy. So he can then bless us richly and reward us. You know, I've said this before. When you've got a rebellious teen, it's, an awful, it's a lot harder to want to give them the car keys. But when that teenager is, yes, sir, and submitted to you and under your authority and taking care of business and being responsible, then you give him the car keys. It's a reward, right? Amen? And, I mean, it's, it's just an analogy, admittedly. Uh, but um, I think Papa God... Kind of looks at his kids in the same way. He wants to bless us. Oh my goodness, he wants to bless us so much. It's, it's, it's a part of his makeup. It's a part of who he is. What dad here doesn't want to bless his kids or his grandkids? What grandma doesn't want to get something right now and, and go out and get it for their grandbabies? You know, I mean, it's just, it's in us. It's one more way we mirror him. He's a giver. Amen, a great giver, a giver of all good gifts, the scriptures tell us. It's easy to bless a holy people. It's harder to bless a worldly people. Consider these verses, Titus 2, 11 through 15. We'll put them up. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope. Look at that. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Hallelujah. And purify for himself a people for his own per possession. And then he tells you, he finishes it up in 15. He says, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. That's what I'm doing right now. Right now. Teaching, preaching, reproving, correcting with all authority to help people walk in under the word of the Lord. Let no one disregard you, Paul concludes. Let no one disregard you. Consider the authority that the apostle Paul had. Wow, I'm telling you, man, that's an apostle. That's an apostle of great order. Amen? Amen. Woo, I'll tell you. 
So why should we live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age? What is our motive? It says, verse 13 says, because we're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. You know, how many times do we look at the problems that are around us and we're trying to look for a solution, which, well, we should, but the ultimate answer is it's coming again. How many times does that idea inspire you during a week or a month. It would be good to put that a little bit more up front in our thinking, I believe. I mean, you know, the way these elections have turned out to many, you know, it's, it's troubling and it's been disappointing maybe. Maybe your man, your woman didn't get in. Um, but, you know, we don't, we don't <laughs> who do we live for? What are we really keeping our eyes on? You know, where is our thoughts really going? I'll tell you, I submit to you, being aware of and remembering of his second coming can be very encouraging to put things in their proper perspective. Amen? Yeah. I'll tell you, the New Testament church that we read about, they were aware of it. They were thinking he was coming back any minute. Another place, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, right? He says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. And in the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We're all going to get that if we love his appearing, if we're looking for his appearing. His coming. I think that's pretty cool. I got a crown coming, kids. You got a crown coming. A crown of righteousness. Because you're looking for his appearing. And part of looking for his appearing is living like we are one of his, too. A special crown laid up for those who love his appearing. Man, the new uh, NIV uh, says, those who long for his appearing. You know? I don't want to bury my head in the sand and just sit there all day long and say, when are you coming back, Jesus? I hope you come soon. But, I can certainly adjust my thinking to allow that idea to inspire me in my daily living. I think God wants us expecting and looking, expecting, anticipating his invasion soon to come. Hebrews 9.27 says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. Here are two appointments we know we're never going to miss. Then verse 28 says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of money, many shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to then sin to those who eagerly await him. I don't know if I gave you 28, sorry. <laughs> what a powerful closing to that first, you know, that first verse of 27. All men are going to die, and then comes judgment. But then, he's coming back, and he won't come the second time in reference to sin. But it'll come for those who are eagerly awaiting him. So here we see several verses that denote that it's good for many reasons to await on him and to eagerly seek his return. And these words were written to inspire the church unto holy living and not just for the sweet by and by, not just for them, but today, right now in real time. You know, some think that the early church was wrong in expecting Jesus' soon return. And, of course, he didn't come back in the first century, and he didn't come back in the second, and he hasn't come back since then. Thank God. God is raising up a big family, right, Joy? He's raising up a big family. 
But let us consider the results of the early church. They had stupendous growth, healings, miracles, signs and wonders following the birth of the church right through the third century. Into the third or fourth century. To what can we attribute that? I, I would say that we could attribute it in part to the fact that they were living a holy, blameless life and they were hungry for his return. They were looking for it. They were set. They were thinking about that. They were aware of that. They weren't yawning through it. Man, it was coming. When's he coming? It could be any time now. It could be any day now. I want to be ready. I don't want to be caught sleeping at the wheel. And I also submit to you that it was the baptism in the Holy Spirit that was preached and inspired as a necessary event in the new Christian life. It was not an alternative. It was preached that all needed to be baptized in the Spirit. Acts 19.2 writes, you know, Paul was, spe- or the, the, the disciples are speaking to these believers and it says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, on the contrary, we have not even heard there's a Holy Spirit. This is an X. We've not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And when Paul laid on his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. They were baptized afresh and new. There was an edginess in this. There was a, they were given up to it. They were sold out for it. And if you look into church history again, right into the 3rd, 4th century, the early church pursued Holy Spirit baptism fervently. Today, we look at it as an option. And if you don't feel like it, you don't agree with it, you can go down to another church down the street. But I'll tell you, every major revival, any major revival that's occurred since the late 1800s, right on Sousa Street, the Welsh Revival, they've all had tons of Holy Spirit baptisms, tons of Holy Spirit manifestations, tons of Holy Spirit movements that, you know, being slain in the Spirit, being, being broken. Even, even early 1800s in this country, there, was, there were many uh, reports. The Kentucky Revival, men in, in the fields, they would set up they would set up little uh, tree stands for the preachers. And a group would gather under that tree in a big field, and they'd listen. And they'd get slain in the spirit, drunk in the spirit. And then a hundred yards away, another tree stand and another preacher. And they got a big group of people. And they can hear and minister. Remember, there's no electric uh, amplification in that day in, you know, in the early 1800s, right? And it was this whole field, this huge field, just full of thousands of people. Kentucky Revival. Powerful, really, worth reading. There was an edginess to, whenever you have the Holy Spirit involved, there's an edginess, there's a zeal, there's a passion, there's a a leaving aside the old, there's an awakening and a, a wanting the new. I'll tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues is a necessary supernatural experience which opens everyone up to more holy living and to a power. Listen, it opens us up to a power we cannot obtain any other way. It gives us power to be witnesses. It gives us power to love when we want to sock them. It gives us power to say no when we want to say yes. And it gives us power to say yes when we should say no, or something like that, when we want to say no. It gives us power to walk it out. What it is that the word has revealed to our heart. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, all the way to Canastota, as far as the remotest parts of the earth. Just amazing, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, Christianity and power go together. Christianity and love go together. Christianity and, and, and new creation go together. Christianity and, 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 and healing go together. Christianity and salvation go together. I mean, what can you take out of there? 
Could we use more of the Holy Spirit? Who could use more of the Holy Spirit right now? Who could not benefit from more love? Who could not benefit from more power? Who could not benefit from more of this fruit of the Spirit? The fruit, the patience, the peace, joy, self-control. Who could not use more endurance and conviction? I'll tell you, it all comes from the Holy Spirit. It's not man-made. Man has to cooperate with him. We have to agree, that's all. That's all we have to do. And then receive. And to be willing to give it away. So I'm going to ask you right now, everybody, just to stand if you can, please. And I'll close it out. But I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to pray right now. And I'm just going to ask that the Holy Spirit would just refresh every single person here in Jesus' name. And I'm going to pray that you would just be refreshed and renewed, baptized, strengthened, uh, encouraged. Father God, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I just humbly acknowledge and bend our knees, Father. And we stand in faith. We stand. We stood up. We stood up under authority, believing that you are the baptizer and wanting and knowing that there, more of you is what we need in our lives, Father. Not more of the culture, not more of our own agenda, not more money, not more of our own ideas. We need you, God, you, you alone, oh God. And we pray right now for a mighty outpouring of your spirit on your church, Father God, for endurance, Father God, for prosperity, oh Father God, for healing, Father God, for strengthening, Father God, for endurance through hard times, God, to overcome come God to be winners that you want to make us to be God because we're your kids we're your kids oh God hallelujah be exalted right now be glorified God in this house hallelujah if you can speak in other tongues then do it just let it go it's the most supernatural thing you could do today maybe hallelujah Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Woo, Jesus. I think the Lord would say, I will even bring strength to your bones. Not even only to your heart, but to your bones too. For I am the author of your life. I am the author and perfecter of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. Empower us to be better witnesses, God. Empower us to want to love even when we don't want to, God. Empower us to endure, God. Past endurance, Father God. That they would say, there's the people of God. They've endured. They're alive. They're on fire. Hallelujah. As we heard Thursday night, they're freaks. They're sold out. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'll tell you, so much depends on God. But we have to just agree with him. And we have to go after it. We do. I think it's good to go after it every now and then. Be blessed. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. And go in grace. And we'll see you next week, okay? Hallelujah. Thank you for coming on out.